Avenatti, Abortion, and Brexit on this episode of The Uprising. LibertyNation.com. They are the resistance, but we are The Uprising with Scott Cusenza. I felt this thrill going up my leg. There's not going to be a President Donald Trump. A president. Can you believe it? This is somebody who knows what's right and what's wrong. You know what podcasts are, by the way? Talk shows for people who cannot make it in talk radio. I just want to say to the men of this country, just shut up, do the right thing. For a chance. I think possibly that's the most unattractive form in which prejudice can be met in this country, is the, the rage of the entitled. Welcome back to The Uprising, a podcast of LibertyNation.com. This is Scott D. Cosenza, your host. And we've got uh, an abortion conversation that uh, may move the needle for you today. And boy, is that great fun. And uh, a special Brexit update from across the pond with Mark Angelides on this Memorial Day weekend. Well, if you thought it was uh, a show without a Biden update, <laughs> you got that wrong. Uh, here is Tim and I discussing abortion and also discussing the candidacy of one Joseph Biden for president of these United States. Back in studio with immediate past former co-host of the Uprising, Tim Donner. Immediate Tim. past and former. That's being Tim. redundant. If you're if you're immediate Excuse past, me. you are inherently. It's Friday. Yeah. I'm in a good mood. Let's yeah, not. Whatever. I don't want to spoil it okay. with that kind of uh, okay. discipline uh, to my speech, Tim. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for doing a good job on the Uprising last week, uh, and also announce to everyone that I've already discussed with you the issue about your aesthetic judgment of Whoopi Goldberg's dramatic career and that uh, those types of comments won't be made on the uprising in the future. It's as folks, just for all of you listening, this is what's called viewpoint discrimination. <laughs> Scott engages it in it on a regular basis and it's there for all it's it's out there naked for everyone to see. Well, speaking of viewpoint discrimination, th something a little uh, more controversial than Whoopi's uh, acting is uh, abortion in the United States. And we've really had uh, I wouldn't have thought that. You know, when Donald Trump was elected, that the next two years would see this massive uh, change in, in or effort to change abortion law in the country. Um, I think that my sense of Trump and his sort of pro-lifeism was he didn't really care about it one way or another, but recognized it was important to a lot of people who would be his base. And so he, you know, he said he'll he'll throw his lot in with those. So but be that as it may, we have these heartbeat bills that are going on around the country. We've got uh, the Alabama bill, which is not a heartbeat bill. It's just basically an abortion ban Yes. Um, with very minor exception for uh, the life uh, of the mother or significant health of the mother. And uh, I thought that, you know, so much of the conversation out there is the people on the pro-choice side screaming at the people on the pro-life side and vice versa. And uh, I think that I, it's fair to call you a fairly staunchly pro-life mm -hmm. uh, person. Yes. And I'm fairly staunchly pro-choice person, and we've—I uh, think we can have a civilized conversation about it, and uh, and that that might be interesting. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about it today. Well, and I think the reason that we can, Scott, is because we have respect for each other's positions, and when you have that kind of respect, you have the kind of rare conversation that we can have uh, here because. I respect why you are pro-choice, and I think you respect why uh, I am pro-life. And let me just say this. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, for all his misgivings, his multiple marriages, and, and the, the statements that nobody can understand who's not a Christian, why he has 85% support among evangelical Christians, given the pattern of behaviors in the past and everything, I think that Donald Trump was basically pro-choice by default because of the political climate in New York where he built his empire. Mm -hmm. You simply couldn't be pro-life in a city that's 90 percent democratic. So, let me just get this straight. Do you think he was – he just – 
that was in the zeitgeist in the air, so he just was that thing? Or do you think he concealed his pro, true pro-life nature? I think you said it best at the beginning. I think he didn't particularly care about the right. issue. So I think when they said, are you pro-choice? He's like, yeah, I'm pro-choice. Mm-hmm. And, and he's even say, he even said in the, in the past that he was very pro-choice. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, you have to cozy up to the Schumers and the de Blasios and the David Dinkins <laughs> right, right. and all yeah. the people he's had to suffer oh, over the years. Can you imagine? So look, I'm not going to, but I'm not going to say whether, you know, he feels it in his gut the way most pro-lifers do. But I will say this, he is easily the most pro-life president we've ever had. He gave the strongest pro-life declaration uh, when he accepted the nomination in his nomination Mm -hmm. speech. He has listened to and sympathized and empathized with the pro-life position in almost every instance, even beyond the point that he had to just sort of nominal, nominally to, you know, to uh, mollify his base. So, I mean, it's ironic, isn't it, that he would be the most pro-life president of all time. But here's two reasons, one constitutional and one faith-based for those of us that are pro-life. Well, before we get into that, let me just say, with the exception of picking Supreme Court justices, the president has very little very to do little, with very little. the abortion question in America. It's more... In 1973, yeah, yeah. we had Roe v. Wade, its legacy bred par- Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and sort of the legacy of, of the different restrictions that are permissible. The Supreme Court has created this kind of tangled web of patchwork surrounding abortion law. There's kind of really uh, ridiculous sort of uh, precedent in terms of that you can actually restrict speech around an abortion clinic in ways that you can't do anywhere else in America. Right. Um, so there's this interesting patchwork, and it, and it seems like I think the backers of the Alabama legislation uh, believe that the votes are now there on the Supreme Court. And if we count, we've got most recently Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, and then the stalwarts. You've got Thomas, he's a vote defi- almost definitely uh, to overturn Roe. And then where does Roberts come in and where do Alito come in? Well, those, are your, those, those get you to five if they'll do it. It's a gambit. I mean, that's what it is. It's a gambit. They're going, you know, they're going for the long bomb. They're going for the fly pattern, not the 10-yard pass over the middle. And so they believe that the, the climate is right. I agree with you and most observers that I've seen that – I don't think it is quite right. Yeah, I don't I, think it will be until— I think we've talked about it on the radio, yeah. but I don't know that we've talked about it in the upper— So yeah. my prediction is at least one of those people, of those five we mentioned, will not vote uh, to overturn And I think that, that one would likely be John Roberts. He does—he is anything—you know, he is conservative, so-called ideologically, but he's also conservative uh, in terms of his own personal orientation, mm-hmm. in terms of his— his style of judgeship for justice ship mm-hmm. to, to make a word. He's not one to want to break longstanding staunch, precedent. Staunch Catholic, right? though, right? Staunch Catholic. Well, you've got, you've got, you know, this is interesting. Most people don't even realize it. There's uh, uh, all Catholics and Jews on the Supreme Court. There's not a single Protestant mm-hmm. on the Supreme Court. I so can't you've say got, I disapprove of that. Uh, well, mixed yes, I know. I know you do. <laughs> no. But. It is yeah, interesting. They, you, well, those are rule based. Those are rule based religions, right? And, and actually, they I think, are. I yes. think that's part of why they come out of that tradition. You know, a lot of lawyers, Jews and Catholics. It's you start early. How can I get around these rules to do what I want? <laughs> but at the heart of the pro life movement, I think has to be a basic um, statement of foundation, which I don't think the pro life movement has effectively articulated, and that is that. In this argument, you have to stipulate that you're looking at two very powerful rights that are clashing here. Mm -hmm. The right of the woman to control her own body Mm -hmm. and the right of that child or whatever you want to call it in the womb to have life. You have to stipulate that you can't just dismiss a woman's right to choose uh, what to do with her own body. You can't just dismiss it and say, well, that, that doesn't have much constitutional uh, authority and power. And also, and this I think is another reason why we can talk about this issue, and it's sad that so many others, you can't say to uh, a pro-life person 
that uh, you know you just want to you just want to control women's bodies. That I think you know we we can really dispense with that argument. It's absolutely ridiculous and disingenuous. We know that what pro life people may I mean maybe one you know crazy person somewhere that wants to control a woman's body, but we're talking about. As you say, the child I, fetus to me is, the, is is a better term, just because it seems more scientifically it's more accurate. clinical. Yeah, more clinical. So the fetus yeah. does the fe- is that fetus a human being or not, and what rights, if any, does it have? That to me, I think, is the principal question involved here. Absolutely, I, I like the trespasser uh, kind of uh, analogy, which is to say, you know, if you come home and there's a trespasser in your in your house. You're allowed to, you know, to throw them out, right? You're legally, but you're not allowed to throw them off a balcony. Uh, you got to throw them out the front door, okay? You can't kill them as you're doing it. And if a woman has uh, a fetus inside her and she wants that th- that out of her, seems to me like she has the right to have that uh, that removed. Uh, and if if so, it's about viability. And if if that fetus is viable to be able to live outside of of uh, its mother, then. Um, I think the law should protect its rights to be evicted uh, gently. I, I, in other words, this is an anti-partial birth abortion uh, statement. But I'm the making, end result okay? is still the same. It's the termination of a viable uh, fetus. And and as I, as, I mean, as vi- I, so I'm just just to be just so yeah. I, I'm clear with my own statement. I, I'm talking about viability outside of the mother. Okay, mm-hmm. so it wouldn't be viable uh, in that instance. It's not viable. Well, one of the reasons that such a significant percentage, and I don't have an exact number, but a significant percentage, highly significant percentage of the pro-life movement uh, is among the Christian community and people of faith because they think beyond the mere science of it to the genesis of the child and the fact that all life emanates from God and therefore all life is innocent and that even covers the cape case of cases the really thorny cases of rape and incest which are still rare you know it's still used as kind of a talking let's, point let's put a but, pin in rape and incest but that, and address that in a little yeah, in a minute i want to ask but, you i want to interrupt with a question for you which is the most mainstream sort of practical if you want to call it that or, or whatever the right term is what is your vision for how abortion should be treated legally in the united states at what point what happens? Do people get arrested? Is it is it 10 seconds after conception? Where do we draw these lines? Well, the faith-based side of me would say abortion should be absolutely illegal. The constitutional side of me, which lives in a constitutional republic, believes that the, the 10th Amendment holds, that states should be able to determine by themselves that if Alabama wants abortion to be strictly illegal, uh, they must be allowed to do that. If Vermont decides they want all abortions to be legal, even up to the point of birth or even beyond in some cases, then I can't really find a constitutional basis to prohibit that. Uh, So the constitutional argument is different than the faith-based argument, but Mm -hmm. I cannot sit here and say that we would, in this constitutional republic, have a legitimate way to deny a state the ability to decide Mm -hmm. for themselves. And then it becomes a matter, Scott, you know, like so many other things, like if you like marijuana, you might want to live in Colorado. If Mm -hmm. you don't, you might prefer to live in Mississippi where it's still illegal. And on the borders of these states, we might see abortion clinics lined up to service the the, the people traveling out of state. Would Would you think that it is appropriate or okay for, for instance, Alabama to pass a law that criminally penalizes women who wish to travel not from women. Alabama to no. seek abortions? Women should not be penalized because, mm-hmm. you know, in, in our view, and I think it's backed up by uh, so many stories over the years, that the the price that women pay for abortion comes in just the fact that they do it mm-hmm. and the fact that they've taken a viable fetus and they've terminated it. And I don't believe the stories that say that has no impact on women. It's just like birth well, control. I, think the data, I don't. Well, there's, I think there's good yeah. data on this, and it indicates that it is. I mean, whether or not it's an ultimately a quote unquote good decision for those women or not, it's not something that, you know, I remember years and years ago 
during the sort of abortion debates and wars of the 90s, the, the, the term unviable tissue mass was uh, turn, uh, put out there as if as the, this was, you know, like a fatty tumor that somebody had removed. And I think the data clearly indicates that it's not uh, the equivalent the of left, a fatty tumor. The, and, um, and Scott, the thing is that, that the, the reason I respect your position is because it's a thoughtful position. But the position of so many on the left is to dehumanize the fetus to a point where it is just a tissue mass. And it becomes just a, you know, another in a series of decisions you check off your list. And like I say, the woman's right to to control her own body is a powerful right, but it comes in conflict with the right of that child to live. And you have to choose between them is is basically uh, what any person deciding what their position is on abortion they they have to they they have to take that mm -hmm. they have to confront that question and the constant not the constitution but the the predicate to it the declaration of independence says the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness okay let and, me stop. and liber let me, let me, but let me no just no stop no let me finish please because liberty and the pursuit of happiness are irrelevant if you cannot have life to begin with, and that's the constitutional argument that okay. I would make. So what about this then? You say it should be left to the states. A state can't start killing people um, for parking in a red zone, right? Right. Uh, that would be a violation of the, the, uh, the Bill of Rights as applied to the states, okay, under our current constitutional system. The, in order for the a state government to kill somebody, they have to jump through a lot of hoops, right? Capital, mm -hmm. excuse me, capital punishment, or to allow killing. I think that th there's a weakness there in your Tenth Amendment sort of uh, uh, analysis okay. of this federalism analysis. Mm -hmm. If a if and let's say and let's make it a tough choice. Let's say it's a third trimester situation. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're not dealing with a uh, cellular mass. We're dealing with uh, a fetus with a heartbeat and a brain and 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 feelings. I mean, and you know, there's no debate here about if the Supreme Court says that is a a human being, just like you're a human being and I am, with the full uh, suite of rights that come with being a human being. Well, then that changes the whole okay. equation. Yeah, okay. I mean, it does. Uh, but as you, I would, see the law me, now, would you argue for that change? I don't know. I'd have to think that through. I mean, okay. I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not certain about that, but I basically decided both as a Christian and as a constitutionalist that the proper position is to be opposed to abortion in all instances to try to change hearts and minds if possible and to have a constitutional framework for making abortion what it should be at best for pro-choice people, which is that there would be enclaves where they could get abortions and there would be enclaves where they could not. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most solid. I mean, look, there's a basic thing that there's only one thing that every person on this earth has in common. That's the fact that they were once a fetus. Mm -hmm. They were once a fetus. So the idea that is a tissue mass or something less than a human is, is not... It's not really a, an, a viable argument in, in my mind because mm -hmm. that is a human life. I mean, look, it's logical. It's a human life. And we're seeing the science is identifying that more and more. It, nothing's changed. It's just that we can see yeah. the well, formation of human life so better think, than we I ever could I think technology could actually yeah. – and I, I think yeah. I predicted this uh, – not that I was – you know, nobody wrote it down or anything. But I, I remember right. some years ago thinking – Technology is going to dial back um, the time with which – when an abortion is appropriate because as we learn more and more – I think these heartbeat bills are uh, indicative of this. This is – you know, we know more about what's right. going on in there um, and that that's – And uh, we can see more and yeah. I think that's the most important oh, point yeah. is that we can now You're see right. it. You're it's, nothing's right. really changed. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, our, our, under, our understanding, but our and, understanding and, and ability to see yeah. it. Yeah, I think that – just so just so my position is stated clearly, I think that at some point but between fertilization and birth, uh, a human being uh, is present and it's not at fertilization. Um, and I don't know where exactly it is, but that's the line for me. 
uh, that I think needs to be drawn and, and then laws applied for restrictions in that area. Uh, where that is, uh, you know, I think science will tell us. But in terms of the uh, rape and incest question, I think that's a very fascinating uh, debate. So um, there was a huge uh, challenge within the Republican uh, caucus in Alabama that passed this this measure, mm -hmm. whether to include exceptions for rape and incest. My And I'll just state my position. It's pretty clear. It's either legal to do this thing or not. And the status of how, I mean, unless you say that, I think the only argument that makes sense to allow an exception for rape and incest is to say one of the reasons why abortion is, is, is illegal is because a woman undertakes uh, sex and, you know, and, and, and voluntarily is pregnant and needs, needs to bear the consequences of that when there's this other interest involved, this fetus. And uh, if it was non-consensual, um, then, well, we're going to make an exception because she, she doesn't bear the burden uh, of, you know, installing that fetus essentially right it's it's the hardest argument to make that if you believe that all life is god breathed then the child of a rape victim is as innocent as that of a uh, of that's conceived within marriage it's a very very hard argument to make but ultimately you come down on the right side i mean this thing is either legal or it isn't it's a very difficult case to make especially for men to say if you've been raped, you know, or a victim of incest, that you must have that child. You gotta carry I carry for nine months, I growing in your yeah, in your I, body. I don't really know how you make that argument because it appears to be cruel. It's a it becomes an esoteric mm. argument for a woman who is the victim uh, of a rape. But it is also let's point out that is a bit of a canard because it's such the exception. The, the rape and incest oh, is such the, an exception yeah. to the rule that it's used as as trying yeah. to make pro-life people look more extreme because they would ban it in the case of rape and incest, even, they'd say, in the cap case yeah. of, uh, of, of rape or incest. Um, it is a tough thing to say. Uh, I think you're right to say that, you know. It is. I mean, that's where you have to change hearts and minds. I mean, you have to be able, you have to be able to make the very hard case that though the child was not conceived in love, that the, you could still love the child, or you could or bear not, the child and put it up for or, adoption. Tim, I don't, or, actually, let me, let me you know, say that. I mean, a, that's a good hearts and minds argument. We don't need that for the le for the legality. It's just hey. You just can't terminate. That's all. We don't have to like it. You just can't do it. Well, I think part of the reason, I think a big part of the reason rape and incest was included in this Alabama bill, Scott, is because it was designed specifically for the Supreme Court in an absolutist, yes. absolutist legislation and law that's now going to be replicated in other states. And as you said, uh, the last time we talked, I forget if it was on radio, the podcast, you said that there's going to be so many states that are undertaking these kind of laws that the Supreme Court's going to be forced to to, to address it, to yeah. say yay or nay. Almost certainly ultimately. I think this will percolate yeah. up to the court. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I think of when I see these rape and incest uh, exceptions, uh, just sort of how I read, you know, uh, my, my reading of the news with respect to liberty impacted stories, Tim, I foresee a lot of false rape allegations whereby Susie got pregnant from her high school sweetheart wants to have an abortion uh, and now has to say that she was raped in order to get it. Uh, yeah. Just like the false health of the mother type things that, you know, some of these, I don't know if you've, you know, the, the restrictions for the health of the mother uh, in this Alabama bill are quite uh, strict, including I think a physician has to personally examine and sign off on it. It's not one of these, well, they said, you know, some nurse signed a form at the Planned Parenthood clinic. It's like a, uh, you know, you actually had time with a physician and for the mental state, I think it's a clinical psychologist has to meet with the woman and sign off that, um, you know, the abortion is warranted in that regard. So that they avoid the inevitable emotional fallout from having aborted a child. And you can't say that there isn't one. There has to be there always has been. That's not determinative of law. I was going to say, yeah. Well, you can't, I mean, it's not. Don't let's not no. sound like we're protecting no. them from themselves. We, no. We're either I mean, protecting innocent human life in the form of that fetus or baby, or not. I think is the appropriate I, I can't, way. I can't. I uh, can't disagree with that. Yeah. I think that's a good formulation. And by the way, I think this has been one of the most uh, 
productive conversations mm. that I've heard, if I do say so myself, on this issue from people who disagree about mm -hmm. it. Well, no better segue uh, we can make than, Tim, to uh, to your report on uh, aborting the Biden presidential, candidacy. Presidential a, aspirant uh, and pro-choice stalwart, I think, uh, Joe Biden. What uh, – when we last left Mr. Biden, he was really exploding in the polls, mm -hmm. um, gaining uh, distance between him and his 20, Tim? 23. 23? 23 the, the, challengers. By the way, the, the elite Fellow media challenges. is misreporting it. It's not 23 candidates. It's actually 24, but who's counting? Who I am, out? I guess. Who are they leaving out? Oh, I don't know. Oh, just anyone I random? Know. I have to go through uh, all 24 profile pictures to real. figure it out. But here's... Here's what I think is it seems to be happening here. I think we can preclude the idea that Joe Biden has accumulated a massive lead because of his obvious assets and his <clears throat> and and what a strong candidate is. And I think we can safely say that his overwhelming lead <laughs> is really says a whole lot more about the 23 other candidates than it does about Biden. Let me, stop, let me stop you there and ask you a question. If that 23 other uh, people, if it was three other people, okay? Right. Do you think, you know, would, would how much of that other support, right? So let's call it, you know, 80% yeah. are for other than Biden, 20% are now for Biden. How much of that 80% would migrate to Biden or or stay away from that establishment? I think it's a that's a very good question because in a, a four-candidate race, it's obviously different than a 24-candidate race. Donald Trump took great advantage of a 16-man field because the, the anti-Trump vote was so splintered <laughs> among the other 15 right. candidates that nobody could get any traction. In this case, my guess is that if you had a four-candidate field, Biden's lead might be even larger. Be wow. Because I think what you're seeing out there, if we preclude the idea that Biden's just such a strong candidate, that's mm -hmm. the reason he's way ahead— I, th I think what you're seeing is that Democrats rank and file, the rank and file Democrats, the party writ large across the country is a lot closer to the center mm -hmm. than you would think from the right. coverage of all these radicals running for president. The Democrats want one thing, Scott, one thing only. They want to be Trump. They want power. Yes. They want power. They yeah. want to be Trump. That They'll take, look. I think the polls are saying we'll take anybody that appears yeah. to have the greatest chance, chance of beating, of beating Trump. And we don't really care about his ideology. Mm -hmm. Now the, the radicals do. The base does. He's going to he's going to be a punching bag throughout mm -hmm. these primaries because he's got 35 percent in the polls. Bernie Sanders has 18. He's doubled Bernie Sanders numbers and nobody else is even out of single digits out of 24 candidates. And like I said, if you look at the field of sad sack and hapless candidates, Scott, <laughs> this says a whole lot more about the rest of the field than it does about Biden. Who is the uh, you think the number one contender to the Biden effort to be the Democrat nominee for president? I think it's got to be Bernie Sanders because he's mm. the real thing. Look, if you're at one of these new sort of new socialist Democratic socialists, whatever you want to call it, right. kind of voters, you kind of want the the real deal, don't you? You want the undiluted and you want r proven for me, for me it's Ron Paul, Tim. Yeah. I want Ron Paul. That's exactly right. But no, it, you, yeah, I don't want Ron Paul light, and I think that's true yeah. for them. On, that, on the I other side, I think it's true because all these others are just posers. I yeah. mean, most of them, like, people like Cory Booker and <laughs> Kirsten Gillenbrand. Right. I mean, they're pretending to be like radical socialists, and it just isn't flying at mm -hmm. all. Cory Booker, by the way. Do you see his numbers? No. Two and a half percent. Uh -huh. I mean, it's gone over like a lead balloon, yeah. his his campaign. But what I want to talk about also before we run out of time here is Ukraine. Tim, I'm making all the time in the world for you. Okay, uh, go ahead. As you always do. <laughs> yeah, the uh the Biden the Biden issue, his children and the uh Ukrainian oil. Let's uh let's talk about it. And well now 
What I'm wondering is, as we put this into context, we're going to play what Peter Schweitzer, who's written the book Secret Empires, which covers the Biden empire. Oh, really? Uh, is he like, and is he like the Cy Hirsch for the Biden family? Uh, like, uh, in a sense, uh-huh. yes. And, you know, of course, he's written a book. He wrote the book Clinton Cash, okay. which was all about the Clinton Foundation. And that got that book really had legs. This one will, too. And I think what we're ultimately have to ask and yes, this early in the campaign, because you can't change the facts of what happened during the Obama administration, will the Ukraine and perhaps China uh, scandals involving Joe Biden be the equivalent of Hillary Clinton's email problem? Uh, is it something that can be overcome or will the the obvious use of Biden's power as vice president to line the pockets of his son uh, can, is that something he can even overcome? And Peter Schweitzer's done the best work on this. He's appeared on TV a lot talking about it. And this sort of summarizes Biden's problem. Go ahead and play Peter Schweitzer. From the beginning, when the book came out, and even today with the New York Times confirming my reporting, what the left is basically do is attacking me personally and now attacking the New York Times. They're not disputing any of the facts. And the facts are simple. Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, uh, got on the payroll of a very corrupt Ukrainian energy company called Burisma in the spring of 2014, where he was paid about $50,000 a month uh, to do, quote unquote, regulatory compliance for this company. (laughs) And the problem, of course, is Hunter Biden had no background in Ukraine, no background in energy. What he did have was a father who was vice president of the United States, who is responsible for all aid flow of Western dollars going to Ukraine. Uh, And Joe Biden made decisions about when to look the other way when money disappeared. Race ipsa loquitur. The facts speak for themselves. And he can't reverse any of that. He can't claim like Hillary that those were just personal emails, for example, Tim, about us weddings Catholics and stuff. Catholics and lawyers you know. know it's ray ipsa loquitur. Okay. Oh. So firstly, no, 100%. And also, this to me is even, man, maybe not even worse, but for, for somebody who wants to be president of the United States, maybe even worse, Tim. He manipulated the... Uh, he manipulated the arms services induction rules so that he could get Hunter Biden a uh, – he was too old to, be, to join the military, but but Joe wanted him to have that credential, probably to buoy his future political thing. He made a special rule for the Navy that Biden – that Hunter Biden yep. then showed up high on cocaine. Yep. And, uh, and, and he I was going to say this this whole thing about him getting this job for 50000 a month in a country you knew nothing about, in an industry you knew nothing about, that was then protected by Joe Biden when the lead investigator in Ukraine, the equivalent of like the FBI director, was on the case of Burisma Holdings. He threatened to take away Ukraine's loan guarantee. So he played hardball to protect and his son. And then what was the result? And four months after he'd been uh, Hunter Biden been kicked out of the military for testing positive for cocaine. I mean, it's, it, OK, so you're not going to use that. But it, it, you don't out. have to. He never even got in. No, that was for his That's first right. day. He That's showed right. up he at showed Norfolk up. high on coke. He coked couldn't out. go for three days. He couldn't he couldn't stay off. Coke, coke. I want you to say uh, what happened yeah. to that Ukrainian official who they pressured. He was fired. Boom. Yep. I mean, so it's the most obvious case of influence peddling. And what I'm saying, Scott, is I don't know how he sidesteps this for the maybe during the Democratic primary, because it would make Obama look bad to bring it up too much. And they don't want to do that of a scandal free administration. Let's not go ahead and mar a perfect record by his holiness, the Obama. Should I mention the check we got from the IRS for having been colluded against by the IRS? uh, That was an oversight. That wasn't uh, that was that's not. Well, it's not a scandal targeting of conservative. If if, if Anderson Cooper doesn't doesn't care about it, Tim. Not a scandal. Okay, you've silenced me fully and finally. <laughs> That's all the time we have for this segment on the uprising. Thanks so much for joining us. And, Pleasure. Uh, Pleasure. People can read your writings at libertynation.com. And also, uh, why don't you go ahead and plug the radio show? Radio show, Liberty Nation Radio. It's uh, up every Sunday morning, uh, 
on the site, but also available a little bit before that. Check it's, if you want to go back to old timey radio, you can check your local listings. It's syndicated radio. in how many uh, how many stations? We're now? about three dozen stations, Ooh. and our our uh, you know our flagship is WRC Washington D.C. on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings. It's a, it's quite a compliment. We we had just one slot on Saturday morning at eleven on WRC Washington. They like the show enough that they run a repeat of it. Two other times on the weekend. So Liberty Nation Radio, starring Tim Donner, sometimes co-starring. Hosted Scott Co- by. Excuse me. Hosted by. Hosted by. And sometimes joined by yours truly. I wanted to say that because I'm a very humble person. Did you oh, know that, Scott? You're not the star. I'm really one of the most <laughs> humble people you'll ever meet. You're, I'm so humble that I can recognize my it's, own humility. It's only, your humility is only uh, eclipsed by your humbleness, to be sure. Yeah, thank you Thank so you. Much. Hopefully that was uh, not too painful to uh, to discuss uh, perhaps the most contentious issue in uh, the United States of America, abortion politics. Um, well, here's a contentious issue that has nothing to do with the United States of America, um, at least directly, I think, uh, which is Brexit. And uh, Mark Angelides is Liberty Nation's uh, managing editor and uh, as a expert on Brexit and a subject of Her Royal Highness to boot. Check. Check. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm all right. So, just answering. Oh, no. There we go. I'll I'll snooze me notifications. Me too. Okie dokie. Now, I know that um, Tim wants to uh, speak to me about Theresa May for the radio. We have no, um, there's no duplication problems that we need to adjust for. Oh, okay. We can okay. have 100% the same content. Mm-hmm. In fact, I almost wish you hadn't told me that because it's like, I don't even want to affect my, you know uh, what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, not really. Let, but, let, you know, let me just regress time quickly. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, I just want to talk about what's happening there from somebody who knows. I mean, we get. Sure. Americans' understanding of these things is not sophisticated. So, um, all right, you ready? Yeah, ready. Mark Angelides, man, <clears throat> man among men. <laughs> Mark Angelides, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, friend of liberty and loyal subject to the crown. Welcome back to the uprising, Mark. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Well, you're welcome. And I wanted to talk to you about, you know, I think the most pressing issue for Americans when we look across the sea to our cousins, and that is... The birth of the royal baby. Baby Archie. Um, <laughs> what is happening? Has Megan and her father uh, settled these issues? Uh, what's going on over there? You, no. you know, I only know one one Archie, unfortunately, <laughs> and that, that happens to be your dog. The podcasting dog, Archie, yes. Well. podcasting dog. <laughs> um, no, we wanted to talk, as I understand it, you know, Americans' understanding of what's going on over there, I think, is a little foggy. And as I understand it, uh, Theresa May has abdicated, and now Prince Charles is prime minister. Is that is that what's happening? Or It's not, it's not quite the case, no. It's... Um, Although if you read The Guardian, you may, you may never know. Um, so what's happened at the moment today, Theresa May has announced, to no one's surprise, by the way, this has sort of been expected for uh, at least a week and by those who follow politics, uh, at least two months, uh, that she'll be setting an, ag- uh, an agenda timetable for when that she will relinquish the, uh, the powers of the prime minister. Can you, and- can you just stop that for a second and tell people, because... In the United States, that we elect a president for a mm. defined term of four years, and then typically they were in, run for re-election for eight years, and then are term, yeah. term limited out to that to that amount of time. How does uh, how does Great sure. Britain select its uh, chief executive? Okay, so we don't have elections for a prime minister. We have elections for the party, and the party before going into the election says this is who we'll have as our leader. Um, now we have fixed term parliaments. Uh, so the next election should be, I think, 2022. There has to be an election. So it's a five-year fixed-term thing. But it can be before that if there's a, a majority vote in the House, the House of Parliament, to have an earlier election, which is what many people are calling for now. But um, so the, it's the party that's elected. So Theresa May is the, the leader of the Conservative Party. 
and this is the parliamentary system. Uh, yes, re- with parliamentary system. With proportional representation, right? No we, no, we don't have proportional representation. No, we have a first-past-the-post system, which means that uh, in each constituency, in each region, of which there are 650, the person with the most votes goes through and all the other votes be damned. Um, it's first-past-the-post. Uh, so what happens is... Uh, each first uh, past the post first okay. past the post yeah like like, like a, a horse racing show sure. um so what happens is out of the 650 constituencies the party that gets the most seats so the most of these 650 constituency seats that's the party that gets the opportunity to create a government so if they get for example uh if one party gets 300, another party gets 250, and then the others are made up of independents or third-tier parties, then the, the party with the most seats, now they may not have a majority, but they can go to the queen and say, we'd like to form a government to your majesty, and she'll give permission for the government to be formed. Now, sometimes that will, uh, they'll excuse, only do Excuse this- me, let me interrupt, because I actually had thought that the queen did not really have an active role in government. So this sounds like it is an active role in government. Is that right? It is to an extent. Um, so since the, uh, since I believe it was in the, the late 90s, or early 2000s, um, they passed, the parliament passed an act whereby the queen doesn't have any real power. Uh, so the, the, she, ha- she now has the power to advise, to give her opinion, and to make her opinions known. She doesn't have the power to uh, enact a law or to, uh, or to insist that something be done. Um, however, it's the, the government serves at the pleasure of the queen. So when a government is formed, they go, they go to the queen and the okay. queen gives permission. It's more a formality. Okay. It's more a formality uh, than anything else. But yes, yeah, so even if they, um, they don't have a, a working majority, so maybe they have 300 out of uh, uh, 650, what they can do is they can form a coalition or get a confidence and supply arrangement which uh, can say, what we, with this confidence and supply arrangement or this coalition government, we'll be able to manage effectively because between ourselves and the people we're choosing to work with, we would have an effective majority. We've managed to create an effective coalition. Yes. Okay. So that, that's how we, we get our parties. Now, as I say, before the election, the party says, this is who our leader is, and that's determined by a vote of the individual parties. So, uh, for example, the Labour Party have, uh, and their members ha- have again voted for Jeremy Corbyn to be their leader, the uh, the arch socialist or magic grandpa, as uh, <laughs> as uh, both his detractors and fans call him, both with different right. meaning. But um, so the, the Labour Party have elected Jeremy Corbyn to be their leader in the same way that the Conservative Party and their members elected theresa may to be their leader then you go to a, a general election and the, the british public vote for the party not for the prime minister of course it impacts if you have a, a disastrous lead leader of the party then people aren't going to vote for your party right. but you vote for the party and what does this have to do with brexit and what will happen if in fact she does resign okay well she's definitely resigning but there's no doubt about that she, she will be gone. It will be sometime after President Trump's visit to the UK uh, on the 5th, I believe that is. Uh, so what will happen is she will uh, oversee proceedings uh, as the leader of the Conservative Party. Um, well, as the Prime Minister of the Conservative Party. She'll oversee proceedings for the Conservative Party to elect a new person to take over the role of Prime Minister. Um, at the moment, we have it in the running Boris Johnson, which many people have heard of, um, Michael Gove, Jeremy Hunt, uh, and uh, Andrea Leadsom, I guess, will throw a hat in the ring again. Um, but once these people, uh, once one of these people is elected amongst the party, they have no obligation to go to a general election. That There's no obligation for that because the parliament is a fixed term of five years. So unless they want to, because they do have a governing majority at the moment. The Conservative Party can just hold out till 2022. If they did go to the polls and elected to, to have an election, would the next election then be not in 2022, but after that? Yep, that's right. It, it would If they had a, another election tomorrow, general election tomorrow, it would then be up to five years, so 2024. 
So if you're doing well and you think you can marshal the people to vote for you, you call you maybe call an election to secure leadership for years to come. Yeah, that that's right. But you need more than just the people in your party to vote for it. Mm-hmm. That that's the thing. It, it requires quite a, you know a proper majority to actually uh, cut short this parliamentary session and begin the process of a general election, okay. which Jeremy Corbyn is, is now calling for. Is uh, the is Brexit the reason why Ms. May is resigning? Absolutely, it is. Yes, um, she's had three years in the job uh, in which to deliver Brexit, uh, and she's she's failed to to do that. So uh, if she had, um, obviously, we've had the the Euro elections, which took place in the UK yesterday, uh, the European Parliament elections, which which Britain shouldn't have been taking part in because we should have left in March. We should have left the European Union in March. Um, But if she'd have gone into these elections and won, um, which we don't know the results yet, we we don't, because uh, obviously all of Europe has to vote uh, for these European elections. So the results will be announced on Sunday. Um, but uh, if she'd have won, she probably could have kept her position. But it, it's fairly clear that she's possibly finishing out of the main parties in last place. So, yeah, it's it's very much a, a question of she's failed to deliver Brexit. The British public are unhappy with it, have decided to give her a, a what we call a drubbing mm-hmm. at the ballot box. And, and she, now her position is no longer tenable. Do you think that Mr. Johnson or any of the other potential replacements will move on Brexit in a in a way that advances the exit? Hmm. Well, uh, to be fair, that the best way, in, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, that the best way to deliver Brexit is just to leave, mm-hmm. to withdraw the uh, to, to withdraw the Communities Act and just leave. Because, I mean, that's pretty much what the majority of people in the UK voted for. What's happened is the reason that Theresa May can't seem to Brexit at the moment is because She's looking for a specific withdrawal agreement with the EU, um, which involves some kind of a customs arrangement or or, uh, various uh, future connections with the EU, which is not, in many people's opinion, a real Brexit. Uh, And so she's failed to gain uh, votes for this in the the House of Parliament. She's failed to gain a majority for her withdrawal agreement bill. Um, So... If Boris Johnson or whoever takes over were to continue along the same vein and try and push through the withdrawal agreement bill that's been agreed between Theresa May and the European Union, um, then I would foresee basically the same problems. It it would be a failure because the Labour Party will never get on board and vote for uh, a a Brexit that actually takes people out, well, takes the UK out because they don't want to leave the EU. Mm -hmm. and the Conservative Party don't have a strong enough majority themselves to do that. They have, a, at the moment, they 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 have a that they have the most seats, but they've been working with the uh, the DUP, which is a Northern Ireland party, in a confidence and supply arrangement. Who are but the DUP are very very uh, keen Brexiteers. They want completely out, so they're not going to vote for it. Uh, so if Boris Johnson, if he becomes prime minister next, uh, which the odds say that he will, uh, if he were to continue down the line of trying to push the withdrawal agreement deal through, um, he, he'll end up in pretty much the same position. OK, well, let me ask you this then. Put put on your uh, put your, get your crystal ball out, Mark. Sure. Fast forward six months, fast forward two years. OK, give me the time frame. Are we going to see a major change in how? Uh, the UK and, and Europe are related or, or is this going to be some limbo that they exist in perpetually? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's starting to feel like there's a, we're in purgatory and, and we're here for a very, very long time. However, um, I'm sure uh, your listeners are familiar with Nigel Farage, uh, formerly of the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, uh, but he's now started his own party called the Brexit Party uh, about five weeks ago. And within five weeks, he's managed to, all polls point to this, he's managed to sweep the European parliamentary elections, which is is unheard of, a party that started five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And pretty much every poll says he's hitting around 34%, around 32 to 34% in, in the elections that we had on Thursday. 
Um, and if that's the case, which pretty sure it is, then there's a very good chance that he's going to be an influencing factor in what goes ahead now. And if he's an influencing factor in what goes ahead, um, odds are we, we, we might get out of the EU. Um, and if that doesn't appear to be happening before the, the new final deadline, which is uh, October 31st, uh, Halloween, what a surprise, um, then it looks like we'll come to a, a general election. And if there's a general election, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Nigel Farage's The Brexit Party became the kingmakers in that election. I and understood. I'm sorry? I said understood. Like he would be able to control yeah. – the, the, the coalition right. would then only come together with somebody who he believed would be a true Brexiter, right? Exactly right, yes. yes. So uh, under those conditions, I so I'm pretty sure that – Either on or before October 31st, Britain will exit the European Union. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else uh, a uh, informed American should be advised of uh, regarding this, these latest developments? No, just keep watching the skies. <laughs> From the UK, managing editor, LibertyNation.com, where you can find uh, his editing, his direction, and occasionally, uh, more than occasionally, a, a written piece. And of course, Mark is also the host of the up. Uh, I was going to say the uprising. Mark is also the host of the Rabbit Hole, which is a totally different kind of podcast than the uprising. It um, brings to life ancient wisdom in terms of fables and stories, and applies them to our uh, our modern times and and the events in the news. And I think it's extremely well done. So uh, I encourage everybody to listen to that, Mark. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Take care. Cheers. Well, I hope you agree that Mark and Tim made for, uh, for a good show today. I do want to close with just a note about Mr. Michael Avenatti, who uh, we spent a bunch of time talking about over the course of the past two years. And, and in spite of me, I, I, there's something about the guy I just like. Maybe uh, maybe it's a lawyer's privilege. I don't know. Or uh, he's got a vowel at the end of his name. I don't know. There's something about him I like. But, oh boy, um, this is not a Schadenfreude moment. That's not what that laugh is. It's just he keeps getting charged with more and more federal crimes. And he keeps uh, – his responses. is um, – well, they, they call to mind the following. You are indeed brave tonight, but the fight is mine. Oh, I don't know, eh? Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look, it's just a flesh wound. The Michael Avenatti version of It's Just a Flesh Wound comes in the form of uh, his tweet that said, Fighting these bogus, legally baseless allegations and will plead not guilty to all charges, and that he, quote, looks forward to the trial where I can begin to clear my name. Now, uh, the idea of facing one single federal criminal charge to trial is daunting both with respect to the resources that it consumes, chiefly financial. It's obscenely expensive. Uh, the other is just you have to put your life on hold, of course, because that's the most important thing, except for breathing, perhaps, that's going on in your life. And the third thing is, of course, you are susceptible to spending some significant portion of the rest of your meaningful life in prison. Avenatti, I think, is 45 or so. Uh, he gets 20 years. Well, uh, that's it. Uh, he has now been charged in multiple jurisdictions with federal crimes. The latest statement from U.S. Attorney Jeffrey Berman says... He used his position of trust to steal in advance on the client's book deal, lied and stole from his client to maintain his extravagant lifestyle, including to pay for, among other things, a monthly car payment on a Ferrari. Rachel Maddow, call your sponsor. Well, that's it. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Uprising, a podcast of LibertyNation.com, your source for conservatarian news and analysis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week at LibertyNation.com. Please like, comment, and subscribe. All the good stuff. Thanks. Bye. Bye.